Hi, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. So yesterday was November 30th, and that was actually the anniversary of the death of Natalie Wood. I was planning on covering her, but, as you may have imagined if you've looked into the case, there's so much freaking information, and there's literally like four or five different books I have to read if I want to get it right, which I do. I will say this, though. Natalie Wood's little sister, Lana Wood, recently came out with a book just last month. I want to say, like, November 9th or November 17th or something like that. So the book is supposedly Lana's investigation into Natalie Wood. I haven't read it yet, but from what I've seen in reviews and stuff, it seems like there's not a lot of new information that wasn't previously mentioned in all the other books. However, Lana did give out one piece of new information In this book, she alleged that Natalie was raped as a teenager by Kirk Douglas. Lana tells a story about when she was about eight years old and Natalie was just a teenager. Their mother, Maria, who was like the worst type of stage mom, apparently Maria took Lana and Natalie, put them in the car, and took them over to Kirk Douglas. And while Maria and Lana waited in the car, Natalie went inside And after what seemed like a long time, she came back and later admitted to Lana that she had been raped. I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm going to wait until I actually cover this case. But if you're interested, this new book by Lana Wood is called Little Sister. So today I'm going to tell you guys about Kelsey Grammer, also known as Dr. Frasier Crane from the sitcom Cheers and also the spinoff Frasier. Dude, this guy lived a life, man. Kelsey Grammer was born on February 21st, 1955 in St. Thomas, which is one of the U.S. Virgin Islands. His mother was named Sally Cranmer, who was a singer and actress, and his father was named Frank Allen Grammer Jr. He was a musician as well and owner of a coffee shop and a bar and grill called Greer's Place. Kelsey's parents divorced when he was only two years old, and he and his sister were raised by their mom and her parents in New Jersey. Kelsey says he goes back to the Bahamas often and calls himself a Caribbean kid. They moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida when he was 12 years old, so about 1967. Shortly after that, his grandfather died of cancer. His father, Frank, remarried to a woman named Elizabeth, and they had four children together. On April 25, 1968, while Frank Grammer was living in St. Thomas with his wife and four kids, a man named Arthur B. Niles set fire to his car. When Frank went outside to see what was happening, Niles shot him twice. During the trial, Elizabeth, that's Frank's wife, alleged that Niles had threatened to run him over as well, and Elizabeth had to pull her husband's body out from the street. Kelsey was only 13 years old when his father died. There are reports that said that this may have been related to a a race issue. Supposedly, Arthur was anti-white, and this was part of a nearly month-long frenzy of racially motivated violence. So just to give you a little historical rehab, on April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee. On April 9th, the date of King's funeral, Arthur Bevins, who was a taxi driver, painted his taxi with racist slogans. According to newspaper articles from then, His cab was ordered off the streets by police because it was covered with statements such as, Kill the White Pigs. Niles also tried to burn down a house and two rental cars at the airport, and he also placed a bomb in the offices of International Telephone and Telegraph Company in St. Thomas. The bomb did not go off, though. So after all of these incidences in April of 1968, Niles ended up at Frank Grammer's house in the middle of the night in April 24th, 1968. And I believe Frank wrote for a newspaper or or something where he wrote a lot about the locals. So he he was some kind of name that was known, some kind of white name that was known around St. Thomas. Arthur Niles was captured on February 10th, 1969. The U.S. Virgin Island District Court decided that Niles was not insane and thus was able to stand trial. But because he was also suffering from paranoia, he could not be allowed to represent himself in court and counsel should be appointed to him. At an unknown date, possibly in 1994, Arthur Niles was released from prison and ended up in Randallstown, Maryland in the Washington, D.C. area. Niles' son, Navaldo Rico Niles, had lived in that area. Rico was actually born on April 9, 1968, which I believe was the date of King's funeral. 
In 2002, District Judge Richard A. Cooper issued a restraining order to prevent Niles from having contact with his son Rico, who was then 34 years old. In response, Arthur Niles wrote a threatening letter dated November 13, 2002 to Judge Cooper saying, in part, Then I would have to come back to Maryland and kill you, Your Honor. At his bail hearing on November 22nd, he said, Just keep me in jail where I can be safe and you can be safe. Or put me in the gas chamber. I do not deserve to live because I have killed people and I am not sorry for what I did. I would be content and happy to be in jail if you could find a cell for me to be alone. A few days before that, Niles had been arrested at a Lowe's home improvement store in Waldorf, Maryland, in the company of Rico, which meant he was violating the restraining order. In court, Niles claimed that the restraining order characterized him as a child abuser. In his defense, Niles said, I'm a killer, not a child abuser. Kelsey Grammer went to school at the Pinecrest School, which was a private preparatory school, and that's where he started singing and performing on stage. He would later earn a scholarship to study drama at the Juilliard School of Performing Arts. When Kelsey was about 16, he started smoking out of a pipe, with his mother's permission. In 1975, Kelsey's sister Karen was the victim of a kidnapping, rape, and murder. Kelsey was 20 and his sister Karen was 18. Karen was kidnapped by a spree killer named Freddie Lee Glenn and his accomplice Michael Corbett. These guys, Glenn and Corbett, began a killing spree on June 19, 1975. The first killing included two other guys. They were some local soldiers that they had met. The four of them kidnapped a 29-year-old cook named Daniel Van Loan. He was just getting off of work from the Four Seasons Hotel, and they kidnapped him to try to rob him. They later drove him to a remote area, made him lie on the ground, and shot him in the head. They got 50 cents off of him. Eight days later, Glenn and Corbett met Winifred Prophet, another local soldier who was 19 years old. Allegedly, they met him to sell him some marijuana. Corbett had been training with bayonets, and he decided to stab Prophet with one just to see what it felt like. On July 25th, Corbett shot another victim in the face, 21-year-old Winslow Watson, on June 30th, 1975, Karen Grammer was sitting outside the Red Lobster in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where she had just finished her shift as a waitress. Glenn Corbett and two friends had decided to rob the Red Lobster where Karen worked, but they left the restaurant without any money when they came across Karen. They forced her into their car, and then they went to a convenience store to rob it, and then they drove her to their apartment, where they took turns raping her for about four hours. When they were done, they put a cloth over her head and they promised to take her home but instead they dumped her in a trailer park. According to testimony, Glenn had taken LSD and when he got out of the car, he stabbed Karen in the back, on the hand, and on the neck. He then drove away with his accomplices and left her for dead. Karen managed to crawl to the back porch of a nearby home that had a light on, but unfortunately nobody was home. Detectives have described a scene where Karen had left bloody handprints and fingerprints where she tried to ring the doorbell, and judging from her fingertips, she was just inches away from the doorbell when she passed out. Nobody was home anyway, but she didn't know that. She died on that porch, and she wasn't found until the next day. Police didn't actually know who she was for about a week until Kelsey Grammer arrived and positively identified her, and then had to go inform their mother. Glenn was convicted in 1976 for all three murders, and he was sentenced to die via the gas chamber. However, in 1978, the Colorado Supreme Court overturned the death penalty sentence. Glenn was eligible for parole in 2014, but was denied twice. Kelsey said to him, I accept your apology, I forgive you, however, I cannot give your release my endorsement. To give that blessing would be a betrayal of my sister's life. Kelsey repeated this when he went up for parole again in 2017. The other guy, Corbett, died while incarcerated in 2019. In 1980, just five years after Karen's murder, Kelsey's two half-brothers, Stephen and Billy, died in a scuba diving accident in St. Thomas. Apparently, Billy failed to resurface after a dive, so Stephen went back down to look for him, and he died of an air embolism while ascending improperly. Billy's body was never recovered. Kelsey ended up getting kicked out of Juilliard. He had a really hard time with his sister's death and ended up missing a lot of his classes. After he left Juilliard, he had a three-year internship with the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. He made his Broadway debut in 1981 as Lennox in Macbeth. He was also in a Broadway revival of Othello with James Earl Jones and Christopher Plummer. In 1983, he performed in a production of Sunday in the Park with George, starring Mandy Patinkin. 
In 1984, Dr. Fraser Crane appeared in the third season of NBC sitcom Cheers. In fact, Mandy Patinkin was the one who suggested Kelsey to the New York casting director, and he got what was supposed to be a six-episode job, but ended up being a regular cast member. The character Frasier would remain on Cheers until the very end of the show. In September of 1993, the character Frasier got his own show, Frasier, which became one of the most successful spin-offs in television history. In addition to starring, he also directed more than 30 episodes, especially during the second half of the series, and he actually sang the theme song at the end of the episodes, Toss Salads and Scrambled Eggs. And I don't know what to do about the salad and scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Frasier got a lot of nominations and a lot of awards during its 11-year run, which ended in May 2004. In total, Kelsey played Frasier Crane for 20 years. In the 1997 movie Anastasia, he played the voice of Vlad, and in 1999, he was in Toy Story 2 doing the voice of Stinky Pete. Kelsey Grammer has a history of substance abuse. He attributes it to the difficulties of his sister's death. In an interview with Oprah Winfrey, he said, The first two years were the hardest. I did some drugs, I did some alcohol, but that was mostly early on. My love affair with cocaine, which was my drug of choice, was motivated by a few other things, about not really deserving the things I had got. Also, I liked it. In 1988, he was charged with drunk driving and cocaine possession and sentenced to 30 days in jail. In August 1990, he was charged again with cocaine possession and was sentenced to three years probation, fined $500, and required to perform 300 hours of community service. In January 1991, Kelsey was given an additional two years probation for violating his original probation through additional cocaine use. The cast and the producers of both Frasier and Cheers tried to hold interventions to help him. His personal problems were clearly affecting his work. His co-star, B.B. Newworth, have actually stated that there were delays with rehearsals and filming due to Kelsey's erratic behavior. Writer Dan O'Shannon recalled, He would ooze into the studio, his life all out of sorts. Jimmy would say, action, and he would snap into Frasier and expound in this very erudite dialogue and be pitch perfect. And Jimmy would yell, cut, and he would ooze back into Kelsey, glazed over eyes, half asleep, going through whatever he was going through. It was the most amazing transformation I'd ever seen. In September 1996, he crashed his Dodge Viper while intoxicated. He then checked into the Betty Ford Center for 30 days. He has been clean from cocaine ever since that stay in 1996, and has said, It was fun. I had fun. It just eventually becomes something you can't keep doing. I finally quit blow in 1996, and that's when I was done. It's a fond memory, but it's no longer a friend. He admits, however, that he has not completely cut ties with alcohol, and he still has a drink once in a while. In 1998, Internet Entertainment Group, or IET, came out with a sex tape of Kelsey Grammer. Kelsey filed a lawsuit against them for stealing a sex tape of him, but the firm claimed that they had no such tape and Kelsey dropped the charges. In the lawsuit, Kelsey admitted to creating a video of himself and his gal pal, quote, voluntarily engaging in sexual and intimate relations with the intention of the tape forever remaining in his entirely private and confidential use. IEG President Seth Warshawski denied having the tape and he countersued Grammer, and then Grammer dropped the lawsuit. But then later on, Warshawski came out and said, we have been presented with another Kelsey Grammer tape but we have no plans to air it. We are still evaluating it at this time. In 1994, Kelsey had hired a 15-year-old babysitter to watch his kids. Allegedly, Kelsey had a sexual relationship with this 15-year-old girl. The allegations first came to light when a lawyer representing the girl's family came forward with hearsay evidence obtained from her friends, but the girl reportedly refused to cooperate with investigators and the case was closed. But after a year of therapy, she changed her story and admitted that she had had sex with Kelsey when she was 15. This is according to her lawyer, John C. Esposito. She claims that she had sex with Kelsey at least three times in 1993. She was babysitting his daughter in a hotel the first time they had sex, and she claims that they had sex again at a resort in Arizona. Initially, she gave a statement saying that the two had never had sex, but according to her lawyer, she had a sense that she was in love with him and that he was in love with her. Her reluctance to cooperate at first was simply a matter of protecting this person she was in love with. 
Prosecutors were also discussing presenting evidence about the girl's sexual history and alleged drug use, because they had to present some kind of evidence that could exonerate Kelsey. The young woman did testify before the grand jury. The panel also listened to tapes of messages that were left by Kelsey on a voicemail service for teenagers. They heard conversations between Kelsey and the girl that she had taped to keep as mementos. Kelsey's lawyers went to federal court and they tried to block the prosecutors from playing the tapes for the grand jury. The tapes included sexually suggestive comments made by Kelsey Grammer. The grand jury actually refused to indict Kelsey Grammer. They said that this was because her delay of more than a year in pressing charges against him made it difficult to support her claim, and it also meant that there was no physical evidence to support a prosecution. Kelsey released a statement through a PR firm that said, I have said from the outset that there was no basis for the allegations. I look forward to putting this all behind me. He has claimed in the past that these allegations were just an attempt to extort money from him. His ex-wife, Camille, she actually made a tweet about this, though. He married her after this all happened in 1997, and after they broke up, there was, there was a bit of uh, tension between them. Or there is. But anyway, Camille had once tweeted, Kelsey had a sexual encounter with his daughter's babysitter. The girl was a young teenager. He was in his late 30s. He hired Roy Black. One thing to say, though, about Kelsey and Camille is that when Kelsey released his book, he said a lot of things about that marriage, and Camille afterwards came back and publicly said that he was trying to rewrite their story. So there is quite a bit of beef between the two. Kelsey Grammer returned to television. Does my voice sound different? I just took a quick smoke break. So in 2005, Kelsey Grammer returned to television. He produced and appeared in an American adaptation of the British show The Sketch Show, which aired on Fox. In 2008, he suffered a heart attack while he was on vacation in Hawaii. He attributed the heart attack to stress after his sitcom Back to You was canceled by Fox TV. Thanks to his marriages, he has seven children total. In 2012, the Playboy model Kendra Wilkinson lashed out at Kelsey for taking his three-month-old daughter Faith to a party at the Playboy Mansion because he couldn't get a babysitter. Kelsey, then 57, had defended his decision to bring his daughter and his wife Kate to the party, and sources close to the family have hit back at Kendra calling her a hypocrite. Kendra said, It has nothing to do with the Playboy Mansion. It has to do with where you bring your baby. A friend of Kelsey's said, it's remarkable that Kendra would judge anyone's life. Who does she think she is? Kelsey doesn't judge her life or the fact that she once worked as a stripper. So, here's my input on that. I don't like to parent shame, at all. But the Playboy Mansion is disgusting. I mean, the place is not hygienic for a baby, and it's not really an appropriate place for a child. And Kendra probably knows a lot more about the cleanliness, or lack thereof, of the place than a lot of the guests do. And for Frasier to turn around and call her a hypocrite is so unfair. Like, she's not bashing the adult entertainment industry here, she's stating that it's not a place for children. And if you want to talk about Kendra like she's some kind of dirty person with no boundaries, doesn't it speak volumes that even she sets the limits for children? Like, even she wouldn't cross this line. Anyway, that's just me. On July 24th, 2020, Kelsey's daughter Spencer had a crazy thing happen to her. So Kelsey's daughter's name is Spencer Grammer. She's also an actress. She's pretty well known for doing the voice of Summer in Rick and Morty, and she's also in the show Greek. She also got her start playing a little girl in Cheers. The Rick and Morty star was dining at an outside patio with a friend at the Black Ant restaurant when an intoxicated man walked up and demanded to be served. When restaurant workers refused to serve him, he started arguing with them. Grammer and her friend tried to calm the situation down, but the drunk man lashed out. A witness said she was hysterical, screaming at everyone to stop fighting. Then she looked down and realized she was bleeding. Spencer was slashed in the forearm with an unidentified sharp instrument. She initially thought that she had been hit by a chair. Her friend had been slashed in the back. Police released a picture of the suspect on Saturday night. The bartender described him as a big guy. It took a lot of people to restrain him and calm him down. He added that he didn't see a knife, but there was lots of broken glass. The assailant ran away and no arrests were made. Spencer Grammer and her friend were taken to Bellevue Hospital, where they were treated and then released. In 2021, Kelsey Grammer was quoted as saying, I don't complain about my life. 
It was an extraordinary challenge a lot of the time, and there's been a lot of pain and a lot of great joy. I wouldn't trade a moment of it except to possibly bring back some people I care about. So that's the story of Kelsey Grammer. He did have quite a bit of ups and downs. As always, remember to check out BrokenLimelight.com for updates, additional information for each episode, pictures, merch, shit like that. You can always leave a comment on there if you liked this episode or if you had a strong opinion on it. Once again, if you enjoyed this podcast, please tell your friends. I really appreciate all the support you guys have been giving me lately. Alright, so that's it. Thanks again. Until next time. Bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.